Uh, where was it? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, my mind was not there. My mind was on the point that I should need to move that sign. Okay. Let's see. Where was it? We were at 23C, is it? Pardon? 23C. Okay, 23C. Now, um, at 22, at 22C, okay? Plato is a rather interesting author. He'll embody within a theme some very interesting and significant ideas. And what appears to be a discussion on the problem of judging between pleasure and uh, we can call it mind stuff. I use that term because he doesn't stay with the set of terms he starts with, but adds to them and drops out several terms. We can call them cognitive functions. And here, see, he's really exploring news, right? He's talking about, and this goes through so many changes, right? Intellect, eye of the soul. mind, and he's making an important point at 22C. Remember, he's saying that when I use the term noose, and our translation in the lobe uses the word mind, he says, I'm not talking about my mind, I'm talking about the mind, right? Now, this is often used, right? Is this what he calls the true mind? Pardon? He calls the true mind? True mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this often is considered a cognitive function, a, a functioning of the mind in some way, right? But here, he elevates it. And we want to see what it in, includes. Now, there's another word which is very important, and that's the good old, and I should remind you that uh, I got it from someone, and I don't want to mention his name, but we just did his dream. Uh -huh. yeah. And he told me in the kitchen that he thought this would be a problem that you would appreciate and could contribute greatly on. I think that's the way our discussion went. Yes, absolutely because this is a discussion and the dialogue on phronesis. What's so important about this word? Our culture has a problem with three primary words, right? And noose is one of them. <coughs> the other is phronesis and usia, right? They don't want it. They don't want to use this term. 
and they don't want to use noose, they want to see there's a conflict about it. And uh, so the third term, of course, is phronesis. Now, every time it appears, we'll make a sound, because what if, while he's talking about mind stuff, he includes phrenesis, and while he is going to talk about each one of those ideas that is included in the idea of mind stuff, he doesn't undertake an analysis of or definition of phrenesis. And that's why Brad said that would be a good problem for Barbara to work on, why he doesn't yeah. do that. I said, oh no, but he insisted, so if there's any criticism. I agree, that's a good problem <laughs> for me to work on. <laughs> but, so let's just go down one paragraph, though, just for fun. <laughs> Philebus comes in and says, well, I'll take Socrates above it. And I think we have sufficiently proved that Philebus' divinity, pleasure, is not to be considered identical with the good. Philebus. But neither is your mind the good, Socrates. It will be open to the same objections. My mind... Perhaps, Philebus, but not so, I believe, the true mind, which is also divine. That is different. I do not yet claim for mind the victory over the combined or mixed life, but we must look to see what is to be done about the second place. Right? Okay. I just wanted to hit that. Now we can go to 23C, is where we left off. And now he's going to talk, would you not agree, his idea of God, which is at, uh, picks up at 23C, agree? And our particular concern will be is while he's trying to measure uh, how to rank pleasure and mind, right, which one is higher, he says, no, 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 you have to go for the mix, the mix life, combination of the two. And then he's going to say, wait a minute, it exists, therefore there must be a cause. So we have four, and of course, Petrarca says, by the way, we might make room for a fifth category. <laughs> and Socrates says, well, let, we'll wait a while for the number five, if we need it. Right. Now, is we, we have to have a new beginning. Right? We've already gotten to that point. We need a new beginning. Then let us try to be careful in making our beginning. What kind of beginning do you mean? Let's divide all things that now exist in the universe into two and perhaps, if you please, three classes. Well, oh, please tell me on what principle you would divide them. Let us take some of the subjects of our present discussion. Uh, what subjects? We said that God revealed in the universe two elements, the infinite and the finite, did we not? Yep. Let us then assume that these two of our classes, and a third made by combining these two, but I cut a ridiculous figure, it seems, when I attempt a, a division into classes and uh, all enumeration. Uh, what do you mean, my friend? I think we need fourth class besides. What? <laughs> Tell me what it is. Well, the cause of the combination of those two <coughs> and assume there's a fourth in addition to the previous three. What? We'll need a fifth. Should have the power of separation, right? So what have we got? We got four classes. Infinite, finite, combination, or mixed. 
and the cause. Then let us take three of our four and see that the two of these are split up and scattered, each one into many. And let us try by collecting each of them again into one to learn how each of them is both one and many. That's our task. All right, that's our task right there. Let's look at the four. Two of these are split up and scattered, each one into many. Let's try by collecting each of them again into one to learn how each of them is both one and many. Okay, we're all ready? So we need a couple of readers to play. You're in. You're in. Only bam, bam, ba, boom. Wait a minute. Uh -huh. Who made the sign? I did. It's Good. been around for a while. Yeah. yeah. I could tell right away that's a, a 14 <coughs> point font, isn't it? Point it is, 14. yes. yes. Yeah. Or fifth something. Could be, yeah. Uh... Okay, play. And we can stop whenever we want. Raise your hand. Stop to show, right? To talk about it. Let's go. For Socrates, who wants to be Soc? Okay. okay. Uh, where do you, you want to start, start with the first then? Mm -mm. <coughs> where, which, uh, which oh, place would you like excuse to start? me, 23E. First then. Uh, E5 on page 245 in the yeah. lobe. Where he says first. Mm -hmm. yeah. First. Mm -hmm. All right. First. Then let us take three of the four, and as we see that two of these are split up and scattered, each one into many, let us try by collecting each of them again into one to learn how each of them was both one and many. If you could tell me more clearly about them, I might be able to follow you. I mean, then, that the two which I select are the same which I mentioned before the infinite, and the finite. I will try to show that the infinite is, in a certain sense, many. The finite can wait. Yes. Consider, then. What I ask you to consider is difficult and debatable, but consider it all the same. In the first place, take hotter and colder, and see whether you can conceive any limit of them or whether the more and less which dwell in their very nature do not, so long as they continue to dwell therein, preclude the possibility of any end. For if there were any end of them, the more and less would themselves be ended. Very true. But always we affirm in the hotter and colder there is the more and less. Certainly. Always then the argument shows that these two have no end. And being endless, they are, of course, infinite. Most emphatically, Socrates. I'm glad you responded, my dear Protarchus. It reminded me that the word emphatically, which you have just used, and the word gently have the same force as more and less. For wherever they are present, they do not allow any definite quantity to exist. They always introduce, in every instance, a comparison, more emphatic than that which is quieter, or vice versa. And thus they create the relation of more and less, thereby doing away with fixed quantity. For as I said just now, if they did not abolish quantity, but allowed it and measure to make their appearance in the abode of the more and less, the emphatically and gently, those latter would be banished from their own proper place. When once they had accepted definite quantity, they would no longer be hotter or colder. For hotter and colder are always progressing and never stationary. But quantity is at rest and does not progress. By this reasoning, hotter and its opposite are shown to be infinite. 
That appears to be the case, Socrates, but as you said, these subjects are not easy to follow. Perhaps, however, continued repetition might lead to a satisfactory agreement between the questioner and him who is questioned. That is a good suggestion, and I must try to carry it out. However, to avoid waste of time in discussing all the individual examples, see if we can accept this as a designation of the infinite. Accept what? All things which appear to us to become more or less, or to admit of emphatic and gentle, and excessive and the like, are to be put in the class of the infinite as their unity in accordance with what we said a while ago, if you remember, that we ought to collect all things that are scattered and split up and impress upon them to the best of our ability the seal of some single nature. I remember. And the things which do not admit of more or less and the like, but do admit of all that is opposed to them, first equality and the equal, then the double, and anything which is a definite number or a measure in relation to such a number or measure, all of these might properly be assigned to the class of the infinite. What do you say to that? Excellent, Socrates. Well, what shall we say is the nature of the third class made by combining these two? You will tell me, I fancy, by answering your own question. Nay. A god will do so, if any god will give ear to my prayers. Pray then, and watch. I am watching. And I think, Protarchus, one of the gods has this moment been gracious unto me. What do you mean? And what evidence have you? I will tell you, of course. Just follow what I say. Say on. We spoke just now of hotter and colder, did we not? Yes. Add to them drier and wetter, more or and less, quicker and slower, greater and smaller, and all that we assigned before to the class which unites more and less. You mean the class of the infinite? Yes. Mix with that the second class, the offspring of the limit. What class do you mean? The class of the finite, which we ought just now to have reduced to unity, as we did that of the infinite. We have not done that, but perhaps we shall even now accomplish the same end. If these two are both unified, and then the third class is revealed. What third class, and what do you mean? The class of the equal, and double, and everything which puts an end to the differences between opposites, and makes them commensurable and harmonious by the introduction of number. I understand. I think you mean that by mixture of these elements, certain results are produced in each instance. Yes, you are right. Go on. In cases of illness, does not the proper combination of these elements produce health? Certainly. And in the acute and the grave, the quick and the slow, which are unlimited, the addition of these same elements creates a limit and establishes the whole art of music in all its perfection, does it not? Excellent. And again, in the case of cold and hot weather, the introduction of these elements removes the excess and indefiniteness, and it creates moderation and harmony. Assuredly. And thence arise the seasons and all the beauties of our world by mixture of the infinite with the finite. Of course. There are countless other things which I pass over, such as health, beauty, and strength of the body, and the many glorious beauties of the soul. For this goddess, my fair Philebus, Beholding the violence and universal wickedness which prevailed since there was no limit of pleasures or of indulgence in them, established law and order which contain a limit. You say she did harm. I say, on the contrary, she brought salvation. What do you think, Protarchus? What you say, Socrates, pleases me greatly. I have spoken of these three classes, you observe. Yes, I believe I understand. I think you mean that the infinite is one class and the finite is another class among existing things. But what, what you wish to designate as the third class, I do not comprehend very well. No, because the multitude which springs up in the third class overpowers you. And yet the infinite also comprised <coughs> many classes, nevertheless, since they were sealed with the seal of the more and less. They were seen to be of one class. True. And the finite, again, 
did not contain many classes, nor were we disturbed about its natural unity. Of course not. No, not at all. And as to the third class, I understand that I mean every offspring of these two which comes into being as a result of the measures created by the cooperation of the finite. I understand. But we said there was, in addition to three classes, a fourth to be investigated. Let us do that together. See whether you think that everything which comes into being must necessarily come into being through a cause. Yes, I do. For how could it come into being apart from a cause? Does not the nature of that which makes or creates differ only in name from the cause? And may not the creative agent and the cause be properly considered one? Yes. And again we shall find that, on the same principle, that which is made or created differs in name only from that which comes into being. Shall we not? We shall. And the creative agent always naturally leads, and that which is created follows after it as it comes into being. Certainly. Then the cause, and that which is the servant of the cause for the purpose of generation, are not the same. Of course not. Did not the things which come into being and the things out of which they come into being furnish us all the three classes? Certainly. And that which produces all these, the cause, we call the fourth, as it has been satisfactorily shown to be distinct from the others. Yes, it is distinct. It is then proper now that we have distinguished the four, to make sure that we remember them separately by enumerating them in order. Yes, certainly. The first, then, I call infinite. The second, limit, or finite. And the third, something generated by a mixture of the two. And should I be making any mistake if I called the cause of this mixture and creation the fourth? Sorry, I was right. No, certainly not. <laughs> now, what is the next step in our argument? And what was our purpose in coming to the point we have reached? Was it not this? We were trying to find out whether the second place belonged to pleasure or to wisdom. Were we not? Yes, we were. Pronosis. And may we not, perhaps, now that we have finished with these points, be better able to come to a decision about the first and second places, which was the original subject of our discussion? Perhaps. Well, then. We decided that the mixed life of pleasure and phronesis was the victor, did we not? Yes. And do we not see what kind of life this is, and to what class it belongs? Of course we do. We shall say that it belongs to the third class. But that class is not formed by mixture of any two things, but of all of the things which belong to the infinite bound by the infinite, bound by the finite, which belong to the infinite, bound by the finite. And therefore, this victorious life would rightly be considered a part of this class. Quite rightly. Well then, what of your life, Philebus, of unmixed pleasure, in which of the aforesaid classes may it properly be said to belong? But before you tell me, please answer this question. Ask your question. Uh, have pleasure, <coughs> pain, a limit? Or are they among the things which admit of more and less? They're among the things... Yes, they are among those things which admit of the more, Socrates. For pleasure would not be absolute good if it were not infinite in number and degree. Nor would pain, Philebus, be absolute evil. So it is not the infinite which supplies any element of good in pleasure. We must look for something else. Well, I grant you that pleasure and pain are in the class of the infinite. But to which of the aforesaid classes, Protarchus and Phlebas, can we now, without irreverence, assign phronesis, uh, knowledge, and mind? I think we must find the right answer to this question for our danger is great if we fail. Oh, Socrates, you exalt your own god. And you your goddess, my friend. 
the question calls for an answer all the same. Socrates is right, Polybus. You ought to do as he asks. Did you not, Patarchus, elect to reply in my place? Yes, but now I am somewhat at a loss, and I ask you, Socrates, to be our spokesman yourself, that we may not select the wrong representative, and so say something improper. I must do as you ask, Protarchus, and it is not difficult. But did I really, as Philebus said, embarrass you by playfully exalting my god, when I asked to what class mind and knowledge should be assigned? You certainly did, Socrates. Yet the answer is easy. For all philosophers agree, whereby they really exalt themselves, that mind is king of heaven and earth. Perhaps they are right, but let us, if you please, investigate the question of the class more at length. Speak just as you like, Socrates. Do not consider length, so far as we are concerned. You cannot bore us. <laughs> Good. Then let us begin by asking a question. What is the question? Shall we say, Protarchus, that all things, and this which is called the universe, are governed by an irrational and fortuitous power and mere chance? Or, on the contrary, as our forefathers said, are ordered and directed by mind and a marvelous phronesis. That one is wisdom. <laughs> yeah. The two points of view. Okay. The two points of view have nothing in common, my wonderful Socrates. For what you are now saying seems to me actually impious. But the assertion that mind orders all things is worthy of the aspect of the world of sun, moon, stars, and the whole revolving universe. I can never say or think anything else about it. Well, do you then think we should assent to this and agree in the doctrine of our predecessors? Not merely intending to repeat the words of others with no risk to ourselves, but ready to share with them in the risk and the blame if any clever man declares that this world is not thus ordered, but is without order. Yes, of course I do and observe the argument that now comes against us. Go on. We see the elements which belong okay, to... Okay, hold it. Okay. What's the role of analogy? It's going to argue for a proof. Right. Take a look at the way in which this proceeds. Because you can take up nearly any modern book on logic and the one thing they dismiss is analogy. So let's take a look at those. Right. Here we go. Then observe the argument that now comes against us. We see the elements which belong to the natures of all living beings. Fire, water, air, and earth. Or, as the storm-tossed mariners say, land in sight in the constitution of the universe. Certainly. And we are truly storm-tossed in the puzzling cross-currents of this discussion. <laughs> well, here is a point for you to consider in relation to each of these elements as it exists in us. What is the point? Each element in us is small and poor and in no way pure at all, or endowed with the power which is worthy of its nature. Take one example and apply it to all. Fire, for instance, exists in us and also in the universe. Of course. And that which is in us is small, weak, and poor. That which is in the universe is marvelous in quantity, beauty, and every power which belongs to fire. What you say is very true. Well, is the fire of the universe nourished, originated, and ruled by the fire within us? Or on the contrary, does my fire and yours and that of all living beings derive nourishment and all that from the universal fire? That question does not even deserve an answer. <laughs> true. And you will, I fancy, say the same of the earth, which is in us, living creatures, and that which is in the universe. 
And concerning all the other elements about which I asked a moment ago, your answer will be the same. Yes, who could answer otherwise without being called a lunatic? Nobody, I fancy. Now follow the next step. When we see that all the aforesaid elements are gathered together into a unit, do we not call them a body? Of course. Apply the same line of thought to that which we call the universe. It would likewise be a body, being composed of the same elements. Quite right. Does our body derive, obtain, and possess from that body, or that body from ours, nourishment and everything else that we mentioned just now? That, Socrates, is another question not worth asking. Well, is this next one worth asking? What will you say to it? What is it? <clears throat> shall we not say that our body has a soul? Certainly we shall. Or clearly we shall. Where did it get it, Protarchus, unless the body of the universe had a soul, since that body has the same elements as ours, only in every way superior? Clearly it would get it from no other source. No. But we surely do not believe, Protarchus, that of those four elements, the finite, the infinite, the combination, and the element of cause, which exists in all things, this last, which gives to our bodies souls, and the art of physical exercise and medical treatment when the body is ill, and which is, in general, a composing and healing power, is called the sum of all wisdom. And that is wisdom. It's really now, go ahead. <coughs> It's called the sum of all wisdom, and yet, while these same elements exist in the entire heaven, and in great parts thereof, and are, moreover, fair and pure, there is no means of including among them that nature which is the fairest and most precious of all. Certainly, there would be no sense in that. Then, if that is not the case, it would be better to follow the other line of thought and say, as we have often said, that there is in the universe a plentiful, infinite, and a sufficient limit, and in addition, a by no means feeble cause, which orders and arranges years, and seasons, and months, and may most justly be called wisdom and mind. Yes, most justly. Surely reason and mind could never come into being without soul. No, never. Then in the nature of Zeus, you will say, that a kingly soul and a kingly mind were implanted through the power of the cause, and in other deities, other noble qualities from which they derive their favored epithets. Certainly. I do not imagine, Protarchus, that this is mere idle talk of mine. It confirms the utterances of those who declared of old that mind always rules the universe. Yes, certainly. And to my question, it has furnished the reply that mind belongs to that one of our four classes which was called the cause of all. Now you see, you have at last my answer. Yes, and a very sufficient one. And yet you answered without my knowing it. Yes, Protarchus, for sometimes a joke is a restful change from serious talk. <laughs> you are right. You <laughs> have now, then, my friend, pretty clearly shown to what class mind belongs and what power it possesses. Certainly. And likewise, the class of pleasure was made clear some time ago. Yes, it was. Let us then remember concerning both of them that mind was akin to cause and belonged more or less to that class and that pleasure was itself infinite and belonged to the class which in and by itself has not and never will have either beginning or middle or end. We all remember that, of course. Our next okay. task. That's a good place to break because now he takes a different tangent, a different tank. So look here. Would you agree? This word noose, which is translated as mind, uh, is cosmic. It, it isn't intellect or the eye of the soul or mind. It's the ruling power. Right? of the universe, rules the universe. I disagree. Pardon me? I disagree. So what? <laughs> so what? You said, do we all agree, and I said, I disagree. What? You said, do we all agree, and I said, I disagree. That's all. No, 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 no. I mean, so what? You have to say something. Right. 
I think that... Um, you don't think there's something that rules the universe? That's not what I said. I don't think the mind is of the infinite. Yeah, I noticed. That now you have to talk, I because you have to... What can account for it if not well, mind? You see, I have these theories, and... Well, please listen. What do you want to say can account for it if not the mind? I think it's a reflection of the infinite. What? It is a reflection of the infinite. It's in the it's, finite. I can't hear you. Do it again. It's a reflection of, of the infinite into the pardon finite. Me, pardon me. How can it be a reflection of the infinite? Literally, do you mean because that? Because it seems... No, I like poetry, by the way. No, no, it's literal. If it's, it's a reflection seen, of the infinite... It's seen through the eyes. It's shining it's, back at you. Well, I, then you have a different idea, but you, could you answer the question, is there anything that rules the universe? That accounts for the order, etc.? It's a possibility. Do you understand that's not an answer? I can't give. You, I can't tell you yes or no. Okay, then you're then you're silent. Is that right? I'm saying it's a possibility. I'm okay. I'm ad acknowledging that that's. Possible. Pardon me. Then you can't say anything about it. Is that right? Then take a break. Right. Think about it. Get help from your colleague and come up with an answer. We need one. I have. It would just be a whole conversation. You're not answering the question, which is why we don't have a conversation. What was the question? Thank you. Is there something that rules the universe, given what has been developed? What would you say? That there isn't any or there is? To take one or the other, or take them both. There may... No. Pardon me, what do you mean no? There's neither anything that rules no. or there is something that rules at the same time? My answer is no. Pardon me. You said, I, is there something that rules the universe? I said no. You would say, therefore, there isn't anything that rules the universe. Watch. Glad to hear it. By the way, if there is something that rules the universe from this text, what does he call it? He calls it the mind. Ah, good, good. Then you understand what Plato calls the mind, don't you? Yes. Right. May not agree with what you think. And no, that was my point, is that I disagree. No, well, by the way, you don't, at this point, you need, you need to answer the question, and you can't hold on to the question because of the I way in which question. you're phrasing your answer. I answered the question, I said no. Please listen, okay? Is there any order in the universe? Louder? Yes. Uh, by the way, there is order in the universe. Oh, oh, oh. Does order come spontaneously, or is it likely there can be some source for order? It is likely that there is some source is, for order. Th it what? is likely that there is some source Course. for order. Thank you. And would you say it's something that's dumb or something that's intelligible in tones? I think it's neither. It's neither, okay. For it to be ordered, it must be capable of ordering something. What kinds of qualities must it have, or it have, in order to order something? The ability to order itself. It orders itself. Of the course. ability. Pardon me. Pardon me. If it does order itself, please listen. I also if it orders itself, it does it exist? Yes. Thank it you. exists. Would you agree anything that exists must have a cause? I disagree. Okay, tell me something that exists that doesn't have a cause. The infinite. What? The infinite. It doesn't have a cause? Well, <laughs> by the way, the thing that you call what orders, does it order the, the infinite? It, the infinite is of the order. The infinite is of the order. Please listen, okay? If the infinite is of the order, does it exist? It exists. Thank you. Does what exists then have a cause? Not necessarily. Tell me why it doesn't. Don't give me not necessarily. Because time and space in a linear 
understanding so what is not the entirety of existence and existence pardon me existence may or may not be affected from something of the future or the past by the way can you try to answer a question can i try yeah try no. okay well sure okay the question is i can try answer it. hold a question. on now all right would you say there are certain kinds of things have causes Certain kinds of things do have causes. Oh, oh, oh. Do the things that have causes, do they exist? Yes, they exist. Oh, good, good, good. So if something does exist, then there must have a cause, from what you're saying. Is that right? No. Pardon me, didn't you say if there are causes, there must be about something that exists? There are some things that have causes, and those things exist, is what we said. Uh, and you want to say then that there are some things that don't exist that have causes? I want to say there are uh, some. Wait a while. Do you want to that, say that? No, that's not what okay, I'm saying. Good, what good, I want good. to say is there are some things that exist that don't have causes. And name two. The infinite. Okay. Is one. Does not have a cause. Because it doesn't exist. Is that right? The infinite exists. Well, I just want to keep with your words. Come on. That's not keeping with my words. Well, well look here. Would you like to come up and write, write down I what would, you think? Yeah, I would like to do that. Yeah. Would you like to put it down yourself? Then I don't have to be... Yeah, fine. I can do that. Yeah, go ahead. Write it on the this board. Okay. Okay. The, the infinite, go ahead, doesn't have a cause. The infinite does not have a cause. And does it exist? And does it exist? Okay. Then there's something that exists that has no cause. Yeah. Right, 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 right. And uh, if you say it has no cause, uh, then it's something that is independent of time and space. Then is that your point? No. What? No. No, oh, it, it's, it's within time and space? No. No, probably, you have to answer one way or the other, you know. It's neither. It's, um... Talking. This is answering what question now? Keep the keep mind. This is mind. Mind. Yeah, that's mind. This is mind. Thought, water, motion. Pardon me. This is mind, which is. Which is thought, which is water, which is motion. This is. Water. Water, motion. motion. Mind is. Mind is of this mind element. Is, class. Right. This mind class. is thought, motion, and water, which is why they say there's water on the brain. <laughs> Do they say that? Right. I don't know. Well, okay. you got it in the mind, so it's kind of, it's kind of like swimming? or It's a function, you see? Um, motion, it's movement. Hey, 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 stay on the point. Come on. What do you, you're fooling me. This is a joke, aren't no, you? No, 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 this is, this is not a joke. This is not a joke, okay. Mm -hmm. There's water on the brain, on the mind, no. excuse me. There's water in the mind. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Okay, think. Move. Ice water or? Think. Um, okay, here, come on, stay here. And matter equal time equals matter. Yeah. Equals body. Equals. Soul. Wait a minute. Time equals matter. So you have three. You know, classes. By the way, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Time equals matter. So uh, uh, that's some time, isn't it? Give me time back, please. 
I can't go back in time, but I can. No, no, give me some time. time. Isn't that? I can create a new time. No, no, no. Isn't that time? No. That's what you're saying. Time equals matter. No, you're not. No. Okay. No, you got to. You don't want to change because I'll get confused. <laughs> metaphors. Think metaphors. Uh, does time metaphor. equal matter? As a metaphor. Then you don't mean As equal to the metaphors, metaphor. dude. You're going to play that one? Okay. Give me the shark. Goodbye. <laughs> if you're going to end up by saying it was meant as a metaphor, you got an equal sign. You're playing games. This is not a game. Well, then you better get straight and talk about it, because this doesn't make any sense. Every time you? I try to talk, you, you talk. No, come on. Stay here. Come on. Time equals matter. Now you're saying it's a metaphor. Which one is the metaphor? Equal? Can I, can I explain it? I don't think so, but I'll listen. I've talked about this before. This is not new. Um, you have mind, body, and soul. Wait a minute. You have mind, body, you and have soul. Okay. Is I going to relate to this? Mind, he says, is of the infinite. It's what? Of the infinite. It is the infinite. It is in the infinite category. I disagree. That's what he said. I disagree. No, he doesn't. You missed it, kid. What did he say? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's help out. Tell her. Mind is a, of the cause. Mind is of the cause. Not the infinite. Mm-hmm. The cause. Yeah, you infinite. missed it. He got the book, too. He paid money Wait for it. Wait a minute. It. Yeah. This is, no, mm-mm. Mm-hmm. I didn't say it. He did. Get, get upset I, with I didn't him. Say it. He did. <laughs> Sounds like somebody's passing the buck. No. <laughs> yeah. Mind is of the infinite. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, is it? Or is that a metaphor? I bet every time you're caught you're gonna say it's a metaphor. <laughs> Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just ask him, ask him about, about that point. Ask You're him. working on it. Ask him about Yeah, go ahead. Point. I know him. Go ahead. <laughs> ask him about the point. The, He's working the point? on it. You were holding the mind is infinite, and he said, of course it's yes. not infinite. What is, what is the mind? I can't answer that. I can tell you where he didn't answer the Plato question. puts the mind. Okay, it's the cause of the infinite. Yeah, is, and it's the point the was, is there some idea of talking of the about infinite. mind being infinite? Yeah. It's the cause of the infinite. I said the infinite has no cause. The mind is not of the infinite. That's but what I'm saying. The point at issue was what was in Plato, not what you're considering. The point at issue right now was whether mind is of the class of cause right. or of the infinite. And in the book, it says mind is of the class of cause. Hmm. The cause of what? The cause of the intermixing of the fire. The combo. Mm-hmm. The water. The thought. Yeah, that's why I mentioned They're that water the around the brain. brain. You can't separate thought if you put I leave you with this. You should no, think no. about it. You leave you with this. Because you haven't you haven't reasoned it. You've just stated it. It's untrue. You're not right. You I have said. reasoned it. No. This no, is no, a work. You, you have a reason to, to us. You just make statements. Well, because you guys are, why. because you are attacking me. No, she's not. I know her. No. No, she's, she's saying, why don't you wake up and follow the book? Because I just disagree. That's what she said, right? And I said, and that was the first thing I said is I disagree. Yeah, well, the thing no, is, no, in order to disagree, it you means you understood me something so I... in order to disagree with it. Yeah. So it looks like you either do or don't understand it. Looks like from the text, what would you say? It looks like I understand it. Oh, good, good. And I have written. Well, about look, it. if you've written it, then it's likely to be true or false. It is likely. Right? To be true. Whereas if you've written it, does that make it true? I hope not. Good. What's your point? The, the, the point is, you see. You're here to, to try to discipline your mind to follow an argument in the text, right? And so no. far, and so far, you're taking a flight into fantasy. 
and we're trying to it's bring untrue. you back down to deal with the tech. So you kind of get rooted, see? No, I mean, I see that, I see that that's what you see. Good, good. And good. that's fine, but I still... Think there's water on the brain. There's blood. Or is that a metaphor? There's blood. As like you said, remember? It's blood. blood. Mind is thought, water equals there's motion. There's blood, there's matter, and there's electric stimulation in the brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Water uh, is by blood. By the way, I got news for you. Watch now, hold it. Okay. Hi, how are you? <laughs> good, good. Do you want to see now what Plato says, or shall we try to figure we out? We can move on. We can move on. I just hey, had to put hey, this there. Hey. Then you're finished. That's it. Is that right? Yes. Have a good trip. Remember the Alamo and other sacred holidays? <laughs> good. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's go back. Um, through all of this, where's Phronesis, Barbara? Don't see it. It's very interesting. Would you agree he's identifying news? Yes. Doing it very well? Yes. Different when the usual? Yes. Absolutely different. Absolutely different. Hmm. And he's also understanding wisdom? Yes. And what are we looking for? Phronesis. That's right. Do you find that puzzling? I do. Yes. That's why we still have a hundred more pages to go. <laughs> I am so <laughs> <laughs> But, um, let me give you another way, okay? Look. <clears throat> How important is analogy? That's Sophia, too. Do it louder? Oh, sorry. Please. I, we were, actually, I guess I should have, well, it became, on 267 in the low, which is at uh, 30 C, 6 or something, it says, surely reason and mind could never come into being without soul. Well, that, for some reason, the, the translator, I mean, that's Sophia, right? Yes. So just, we've been watching Sophia, then we have three lines above Sophia and Excuse mine. Me. Barbara, give and me then the first it's, he translates it, page. reason in mind. 267. In the low. Yes, jump in. 30C. Yeah. 30C. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it says, um, well, right, right underneath there it says, uh, well, do you see where it says reason, wisdom in mind? Like, mm -hmm. And then it says yes, most justly. And then below that it says surely, sorry, wisdom in mind. <laughs> Let me try this one more time. That he concludes that if that is not the case, it would be better to follow the other line of thought and say, as we've often said, that there is in the universe a plentiful infinite and a sufficient limit. And in addition, a, a by no means feeble cause which orders and arranges years and seasons and months and may most justly be called Sophia and Nous. Yes, most justly. Surely Sophia and Nous could never come into being without soul. Right? So the, the terms are, don't vary, but the translation varies. Mm -hmm. So because Daniel was, among others, was looking at Sophia, mm -hmm. and, and we, you know, the text was falling. I didn't want to jump in. Mm -hmm. Isn't that bizarre? It is bizarre. And then, it, it says in the nature of Zeus, you could say that a kingly soul and a kingly mind, that's the word basile king, right? Which means king. And, right? That a king, in the nature of Zeus, you, you would say that a kingly soul and a kingly mind were implanted through the power of the cause, and in other deities, other noble qualities from which they derive their favorite epithets, certainly. Now do you now do not imagine, Protarchus, this is mere idle talk of mine. It confirms the utterances of those who declared of old that Nous always rules the universe. Okay, and what's interesting about that is that it's arche, you know, it could so often could be you know, which is that word for source, mm -hmm. rule, principle, it underlies mm -hmm. the idea of arche is just Archie being translated here rule is very interesting. So. So, um, see, what we're really running around is this issue. 
what's the explanation for this rather curious, which we see again and again, switching words? Oh, no idea. Right? Like, why is that going on? They don't want to. They don't want to translate phronesis for one. That makes it. They do not. Well, that's clear. They do not want to translate that one word, phronesis, when there's a perfectly good word for wisdom, Sophia. Yeah. And they keep putting in wisdom when it's phronesis again and again and again. Yes. No clue. So let me raise a hypothesis. Okay. What if. Um, Let me shift gears. What do you think of this as a dialogue? Let's sit, let's kick back on for a moment, okay? You've all read dialogues. What is it about this dialogue? Is there anything interesting or unique about it that's different than other dialogues? Okay. Is there anything unique about this kind of dialogue? As, to, as opposed to other of Plato's dialogues? Of other Plato's dialogues, yeah. yeah, yeah. The interlocutor is, is, not, uh, is not following all the steps, uh, unlike others. Yeah. The, the people with whom he is talking, Philebus and Petrarchus, are not capable at many points in continuing oh, the dialogue right. without continuously calling on Socrates for help. And quite clearly, you do so it. They put you do words. it. No, no, no. That's unique, isn't it? Well, if I leave, it doesn't even want to try it. No. It's not no. even going to try no. it. And the really it's weird thing is that, um, the really weird thing is that he's actually answering it, where in the other, in the other cases, if they tried to get him to answer, he, he would always get, if he thought they were capable, he would certainly draw it out of them. Now, let me try this one, okay? level of skill is being shown in this dialogue as he talks with Philebus and Protarchus? He's bringing him along, isn't he? He's bringing him along. Philebus can't dialogue, right? So therefore, that's out. But Protarchus at least can go along, and he does make several interesting points. Well, so that's my question. What level of skill in dialogue is Socrates showing in being able to take someone who's incapable of dialoguing? Right? One. Two, how about the person who is capable, who is willing to go along, even though he has great difficulty? Two levels of ignorance, aren't there? One person who can engage in dialogue, and the other one who can, even though needs great help and assistance, he's willing to go along and calls on Socrates again and again for help. Now, what state of mind does that require in order to pull that off? Empty. A good one? Could that be for nations? Hmm. He would have to understand the nature of their ignorance. You have to, to know the nature of, of each of their each of those two people. Their ignorance. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because Philebus is not able to dialogue. But he comes in and makes a couple of points here and there. So look here. So we want to watch to see this more and more about this curious word for nations. And why our culture can't play with that term, and the other terms we've mentioned. Hmm. If 
What is the role of analogy in this dialogue? Simplify. Central, isn't it? Right. So if someone can go along with an analogy, has the ability to go along with an analogy, that's a step, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Certain people can't do that because they're drowning in their own views and therefore they, they can't engage in a dialogue, can they? Ah. Um. Is it likely then you could say that there are certain levels of skill in this dialogue? Is he raising them? Is he lifting them up, as it were? Protarchus, yes. Protarchus, yes. In other words, it's something like this? Yes. And he's getting him into talking about the nature of mind, which normally he would never or couldn't do? Hmm. Hmm. I wonder then, since now he has everything now to go on a much, from this point on, it's going to be a very much more interesting dialogue because he's reached a point now where he has the foundation for a new kind of thinking. He's provided it through dialogue with Simple analogy. analogy. Right. Right. Central. He brought it to his level. Yeah. And let him raise that, his own level. That's the level. That's exactly what he was doing. Now that he's familiar with this use, he can draw, watch, he's going to draw upon it to build. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to have fun saying. Yeah. 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 He's, he's turning, he's turning Protarchus back upon himself, right, using the, like, uh, all the elements, your body, what are you made up of, and then is that nurturing and nourishing right, the, the body of the universe or vice versa? Yeah. Right? Where'd your soul come from, Protarchus? Yeah. <laughs> you have a body? Uh-huh. Oh, is there some order there? Uh-huh. Oh. Are the same elements in the universe? Uh-huh. Wait a minute, is there an order in the body? Uh-huh. Does that mean, ha, ha, an order to the universe? All through an element. Yeah. Draw away mm -hmm. into metaphysics, it's mm -hmm. analogy. Especially when you're dealing with these, you know. Um, any announcements? I heard there's something happening tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. It's an announcement. Tomorrow night. Pardon me? I heard something's happening tomorrow night up in L.A. Oh, yeah. I'm giving a talk in L.A. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the announcement with me. Does anyone have the announcement? I put it in my pocket, but I uh, changed my pants. Oh, here it is. You only have one, though. Uh, 2560 North Beachwood Drive. It's at the Anne Bazant uh, Old Temple of the Theosophical Institute, later turned into a silent cinema. And uh, they asked me to give a talk every, the first Saturday of every month. But I only listed five because I figured there wouldn't be anyone after the fifth. <laughs> I thought of the fourth, but I stuck in a fifth. So, um, using our problems and dreams to awaken the soul. And, uh, what time? Seven o'clock. Thank you. Who's, this was yours. Thank you. You may leave it here in case. I can leave it there for people. Who oh, there's two of them. My own. All right. Okay. What do you want to? What, what shall we explore now, now that we're taking a break?
What's the difference between phronesis and wisdom? Thank you. That's exactly where we're at. Okay. I mean... That's right. You got the absolutely right question. Like you wondered why people don't use the word phronesis, but they use wisdom instead, I guess. People who, Julie? Who's the people? Yes, but well, there should be. Was saying, but oh, there the should be a difference. The culture. The culture of the, yeah. Who's the culture? And so far, would you agree he's taking care to define certain words, but so far he doesn't touch the very word that's repeated again and again about which we have the question, which is phrenesis. Um, I, I can't agree to that, but what? I, I can't agree. I don't see the I don't see it as clearly as you do that he's using one word over the other. But what's the difference if he's using Pardon me. Let wisdom me do it again. rather than okay. Okay. That's the mystery. You got mm -hmm. it. Okay. That's the puzzle in the book. Okay. Okay. Look, make sure, okay? Mm -hmm. There are two words. All right? Different. Mm -hmm. For some cu curious reason, the translators, when they do it, they look at and they just use this, mm -hmm. not this. And then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They link it with a word which may or may not be the same, but appears to be different. It's a curiosity, then, is it not? Look, see? See, um, just to highlight this, most people in this game would say the way in which mind is being described right? should should show if you're if you're looking at the principle of order behind it I'm right? looking at the word principle behind it um, and if you're going to call this uh, king of heaven and earth you're going to call it the mind king of heaven and earth Right. He's really going to some interesting reflection to come up with the idea of mind, isn't it? Right? It's the king of heaven and earth. It's the cause of all of the three other classes. He's doing great, isn't it? Well, by the way, the word he's using, however, is often this word intellect but that's often considered to be a particular cognitive function of people especially being able to intellect the nature of the nature of reality but rather than using it that way he's using it <coughs> as the creative source of the universe or yeah. Zeus, mm -hmm. or theologically, Zeus. Mm. Or we could say it, it's the wisdom of Zeus. Oh, by the way, another word for wisdom is this phrenesis. So shouldn't we find the difference between the two? So far, he isn't giving it. Do you find that curious? Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, and put it another way, forget this financial stuff. Would you agree through the dialogue he's showing a certain use of the mind? Socrates is exhibiting the use of the mind, isn't he? Right. He's trying to bring a change in Protarchus, isn't he? And hopefully Philebus. That's a creative use of the mind, isn't it? Yeah. But not He's just creating that. something, isn't he? <clears throat> Definitely. But, but not just any change. Pardon? Not just any change 
in Philebus or Protarchus, but, but a benefit. A benefit, yeah, and a very sophisticated development. Yeah. Whew. Whole change in a psyche. Not just any change, but yeah. specifically benefit. Yeah, I th I'm cl of course I'm glad you said that because you're hitting on this. Um, it's not just creative, right? But you're saying stress the idea that it's a very great benefit to whomever it is that receives it or participates in it. Which makes it a good. Which makes it a good. Yeah. So, see, see, that's why we can say if Socrates is doing that, what are we going to call that? That's phronesis. And maybe that's phronesis. Because yeah. it's the processing of mind. Yeah. That's the see ya. Yeah, it's the process. Yeah, it's turning about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the see also. We see a stem. But having <coughs> Protarchus learned the see and the allergy, is at the heart of the process. Yeah. That leads him into it. He, he's willing to see through the analogy. But that is the wrong. Yeah. Analogy. Yeah. Skillful, too. Please. Can you explain a line to me? I don't know. Excuse me? Know. Hold it. Let me get the text. What page are you? 255. 255. Jump in, please. It's at the top where Socrates says, no, not at all. As the next sentence said, I don't understand what he's referring to. And as to the third class, understand that I mean every off offspring of these two, which comes into being, into Isia, as a result of the measures created by the cooperation of the limit. One of my favorite sections. Yeah, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> well, I have many things I'm clear about this. Um, I compare that paragraph to paragraphs on 251, and I don't understand what... Oh, wait a minute. Why are you moving? Well, he's using the examples from before. Well, no, no, not 251. At the bottom, I think. 251, then I think I can bring out what I'm confused about better. On 251, where Socrates says, you have 251? Yes, mix with that the second class, the offspring of the limit. What class do you mean? The class of the finite, which we ought just now to have reduced to unity as we did that of the infinite. We have not done that. But perhaps we shall even now accomplish the same end, if these two are both unified. And then the third class is revealed. What third class? And what do you mean? The class of the equal and double and everything which puts an end to the differences between opposites and makes them commensurable and harmonious by the introduction of number. That's true. So here the Good. third class, right, the second class is the offspring of the limit, the mm -hmm. finite. And then the third class um, <clears throat> am I understanding this right, is also about the finite. Mm -hmm. So class two and class three somehow related to the finite. But there's also an infinite in the third class. Like if you look at the acute in the grave, it isn't as though in in speech for the Greeks it was a, a definite, like an E sharp, and it was always an E sharp. The acute could be anywhere within that range. So, so like, where's the acute in this? Well, he's r r making a grammatical reference. It's at the bottom of 251. He's in the, in the acute and the grave, the quick and the slow. So he's talking about the meter and the, and the pitch of the speech and all of the musical harmonies that come out of it. So you, there's only a limit to what you can, as to say, the height of, a, of an acute accent. 
or the highest pitch yeah, that you can make. Do you put the acute and the grave in which class? The second or the third? Those would be third. Mm -hmm. Because they have a finite, but there's also something infinite within them, within the finite uh, boundaries. Are those That's right. That's, That's what happens. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, <coughs> it's a high pitch. And uh, grave is a middle pitch. Middle, so, not low. Last point. Okay. By the way. Wait, 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 wait. So then. Please hold it. If the third class is the class composed of equal and double and everything that puts an end to the differences between opposites and makes them commensurable and harmonious by the introduction of number, what's the finite class? there is something rather interesting about the quotes you have found, especially on 255. Uh, the offspring of the two, which is the create, which is a mixed class, comes into being as a result of the measures created by the cooperation of the finite. Look what he's assigning. He's yeah. assigning power. He's assigning number and power. Right. He's assigning power, which comes into being as a result of the measures created by the cooperation of the finite. Cooperation so the finite are tipping their hat and saying, thanks. Right? It's a cooperation. Mm -hmm. Every offspring of these two, which comes into being as the result of the measures created by the cooperation of the finite. So that means the finite must have some kind of rationality to be willing to cooperate to bring into existence that third. So that's one of my favorite paragraphs. I'm glad you mentioned yeah, it. Yeah. What is it? What's so I'm, I want to just continue your thought, but that's no, but that's where I wanted to go. But first, I wanted to make, make clear what's in the finite class. I, I thought what was in the finite class was on was the was exactly what I just read the equal and the double. <coughs> For instance, on page two forty nine, he says first equality and the equal then the double and anything which is a definite number or measure in relation to such a number or measure all these might properly be assigned to the class of the finite right mm -hmm. so then what what daniel was just saying is in the third class the class of the equal and double and everything which puts an end to the differences between opposites and makes them commensurable and harmonious by the introduction of numbers sounds to me like not the third class but the second class, the finite. The number, it's the measure. What's the bonus number? The measure. The measure. I'm at 25B. 25B. Yeah. Thank you. See, each, I, I'm not yet clear about your point, but each of these is a unit, but now he's talking about the unification of these two, isn't he? That's another unit. What is the unit that's called the finite? It's a unity of what? What's the unit? What's the finite? Well, what's in that class? Oh, well, okay. Um, the e well, um, like two could be in that class. No, no. but I mean, no. you mean, I want to know if this paragraph, if these paragraphs I just read are in two or not. Oh no, I don't mean two the class. I just meant the no, I was giving you an example. No, of, I know. I don't want oh, it to should be the offspring of the limit. Go ahead. I, I was just coming up with an example of something in class. Please two. go right ahead. The number two is in the class two. Yeah. Yeah, but but. 
the, the two paragraphs I read, are they in the, in the class of the finite? Yes, it's all the things of equality and equal and double and anything definite number. And then what's... And the difference between that and those other things you read on page 251 is that there's an infinite of more and less in each of those examples, even though they have finite boundary conditions. The warmer, they still have, yeah, colder. they have warmer, colder, more or less, in one way or another. Some can always be warmer, some just Well, I'm clear, on the, I'm clear on the infinite. And now we're agreed on the finite. So what's the mixture then? The point of reference between them. Hold it. To make sure, make sure you quote, get a good quote to help him. Okay. When he, where's the, what page is the um, measure where he says cooperation to create the career? 255, that's the first paragraph he brought up. Yeah, 250. Page? 255, that's the first thing that he brought Go ahead. up. Uh, as to the third class, understand that I mean every offspring of the two which comes into being as a result of the measures created by the cooperation of the finite. Right. And as soon as the finite cooperates, it creates a point of reference as a number. The infinite, it becomes the finite at a point of reference in cooperation between the creator and the experiencer. You. That's the final. I think a good example is where he says, where he brings it up in cold and hot weather, because he says the introduction of these elements, being weather, removes the excess and indefiniteness and creates moderation and harmony. Because no longer are you dealing with yeah. colder, hotter, <coughs> which can go on indefinitely, but you're dealing with a real boundary, a finite boundary condition, you know, whether they knew about zero Kelvin or, you know, whatever. It's still, there's a, there's a boundary so condition. You, you mean like a bounded range? Yeah. Bounded range. Mm -hmm. It can't get any colder than a certain thing in terms of weather. But it can be infinitely subdivided. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, it, it encapsulates both finite and infinite as That's a bounded right. range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but was that helpful? No. You, but you have to make your case come on, stronger because you want to hear the point. Make your point again. Come on, it was a good point. Well, no, I get the point. I mean, I think he's answering the question: What constitutes elements in the class of the finite? Well, see now, now you're describing. Okay, on page two fifty one, the class of the equal and double and everything which puts an end to the differences between opposites and makes them commensurable and harmonious by the introduction of number. Is that, is that a definition of what you just talked about? No, um, that, that would be finite. The second, yeah. finite. That would be class two. Whereas what I was just talking about would be three. Where's the definition of three? Not an example, but I, I want to have a sentence that compares definition. I think um, you have to make this. Uh, and notice on 251, the paragraph I just read, he's answering the question, what third class and what do you mean? And he answers the class of the equal and double, blah, blah. I think, maybe I can help, okay? Look here. Um, see if this is your point. On 251, the class of the finite, which we ought just now to have reduced to unity as we did that of the infinite, we have not done that. Perhaps we shall even now accomplish the same end. If these two are unified, and then the third class is revealed, what haven't we done so far? 
Oh, no, he's right. On, on, uh, now, I, now I get what you're saying. That he's using the definition for the third class, and it does make sense. It sounds like it doesn't, but it does. The, um, when he's saying the class of equal and double and everything which puts an end to the differences between opposites and makes them commensurable and harmonious by the introduction of number, it is the third class. Because he's talking about, like, uh, like once you have... Yeah, I get a chair. Yeah, no, no, go in the middle. Once you have... Uh, once you start putting them into, you know, ratios, then, you know, it, you can go forever in that. And so you do have an infinite within the within, finite within boundary the finite. conditions. How many ratios within the I think, he, I think he has a definition of the third See, class on page The thing you want to do, Booker, can we use the text, though, to answer it? Mm -hmm. And I, I like your example, but is that in the book? Yeah. Right Two in thirds? this paragraph. Yeah. The class of the equal and the double, and everything which puts an end to the differences between opposites and makes them commensurable and harmonious by the introduction of number. That's a description of Pythagorean arithmetic in, in that sense, I, I think. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, maybe I can sharpen the. Is the question was okay. the third, Shh, wait the a third minute. class? The Is he describing the finite class What is this paragraph then? The class of the finite, which we ought just now to have reduced to unity. What does that mean? We ought just to have reduced to infinite to, to mm -hmm. unity? As we did with the infinite? We have not done that. We perhaps shall even now accomplish the same end. If these two are unified, and then the third class is revealed. So how is he going to get the, the second class? By getting the third. First unifying the two. Well, you're saying, but if these two are both unified... So so what third class do you mean? Now, from this point on, would you agree he's talking about the third class? Therefore, all the examples can't be used to define the second class, can they? Right. Now, if you wanted to, a part of the game we could be, you know, uh, is that important? Yep. That he's unifying these two? Because he's making a third, a third yeah, distinction. Third. This is one, this is one, and that's one. Yeah, but that's mixed. not the third. It's the mixed. Ah. Not at this point. Not at this point. Yeah. Now, um, so just what, let me just last point on page 251, the same point that you were making. Mm -hmm. And again, in the case of the hot and cold weather, the introduction of these elements removes the excess, the indefiniteness, creates moderation and harmony. Second or third? Third. It's the it's second, the third. On third, isn't it? Second or third class? Second on third. Isn't it? Moderation would be the third. Because, hence, therefore, 
Hence arise the seasons and all the beauties of the world by the mixture of the two. Yes. Right. So, it's so we're still hot on the trail of the finite. Would you agree the infinite class is the ER? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has no fixed quantity? <coughs> now, quantity, quantity, he says, hey, quantity rests and there's no progress.